prioritize and, and lift up the Word of God uh, in our worship services. And we're going to do so now in just a minute by reading Luke chapter 2. It's the Christmas season. Hallelujah. And today we're going to celebrate Christmas as a church together, as a church family. You'll be celebrating it with your immediate families and maybe your extended family in just a couple days from now. Uh, but we're going to celebrate it together. When we talk about celebrating Christmas, what are we really celebrating? Maybe that's an easy question for most of you here. Uh, but the question is still there. What is Chris Christmas really all about? During the Christmas season, we open presents. We light up Christmas trees. We sing carols. We drink eggnog. But we all know that this is, of course, not what the season truly means. Brianna and I were watching How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and the, the old 1966 animated one. Uh, and I noticed that Dr. Seuss himself pointed out that Christmas is about so much more. As I'm sure you know, How the Grinch Stole Christmas is about a grumpy man who hates the season of Christmas. So in the middle of the night, he dresses up as Santa. And he goes down the mountain to the near town of Whoville, and he takes all of the trees, he takes all of the decorations, he takes all of the lights, all of the presents, all of the food for the Christmas feast. And he steals it, and he climbs up the mountain, intending to dump it over the side. As he prepares to dump it over the side, a dawn breaks on Christmas morning, and he hears a faint sound upon the wind. And as he hears that sound, he looks down over the mountain into the town, and he sees all of the people of the town, the Who's of Whoville, gathered together, singing a Christmas carol. Here is Dr. Seuss's description of the Grinch's reaction. He stared down at Whoville, the Grinch popping his eyes. Then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every Who down at Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming, it came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling, how could it be so? It came without ribbons, it came without tags, it came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Merry, a uh, maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. I like the, the rhyme and the poetry of Dr. Seuss's words here. It sounds nice, but I also like that it points out that Christmas is, of course, about so much more than just the material things. It's more than presents and eggnog. Christmas is really about Jesus. Yes. It's about Christ Jesus, the Son of God, coming to this earth, taking on flesh, paying the price for our sins, and being raised to the right hand of the throne of God. It's about our Savior Jesus coming to dwell with man from heaven, from eternity. Hallelujah. This Son of God came down to dwell with us, knowing that we were sinners, knowing he was coming into a cursed and depraved world, but he came so that he could take on flesh, assuming humanity for himself, and dying in that humanity for our sins, so that we might be saved from the guilt and the shame that comes with the sin that we have committed. Yes. Jesus came down to earth in the, in the form of a small baby boy, and this baby boy grew up to be the savior of the world. Yes, how So today we celebrate Jesus and his birth. But we also are longingly waiting for the time when he returns to save us finally from the sin we still struggle with and from the depravity of this world. So much more. It's with all of this in mind that we turn toward the book of Luke today, to the text in God's word today. Today we're going to read about the birth of Jesus and see just what the birth of Jesus means for you and for I. So if you're ready, let's read together the first seven verses, the first three verses for now of Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered each to his own town. 
Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for recording these to us. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for giving us your word in the book of Luke. Thank you for revealing to us what you have done in history to save us from our sins. Yes. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to be born as a small baby, a man just like us, so that we might be saved. All of humanity might be saved. Lord, we pray that we would understand your word this morning, that you would help us understand it, that you would open our eyes to see the message you have for us in your word. Pray, Lord, that we would be affected and changed by your word, that we would conform to your word, that we would live it out. And Lord, we pray that we would trust in the Son of God that you have sent for us. Thank you, Jesus. It's in the wonderful, precious name of Jesus that we pray this morning. Amen. Before we dive into the text and examine it a little more closely, let's remember what Luke has told us has happened in history up to this point. Let's remember a little bit about what's happened up to this point in the book of Luke. The first narrative in Luke is about a man named Zechariah. Zechariah is a priest and he's in the temple and an angel comes down to Zechariah and says, Zechariah, your barren wife. Your wife, who is beyond the age of childbearing, she will conceive and bear a son. And this son will be great and be a prophet who goes before the Lord to prepare for the Lord a people ready. Then in the, in the next narrative, we see another prediction, an even greater one, an even greater prediction than a barren woman becoming pregnant. That very same angel named Gabriel comes to another woman, but this time it's to a young woman. Mm -hmm. It comes to a woman named Mary who is engaged to a man named Joseph. Mary is from Nazareth, a seemingly insignificant town. The angel comes to Mary and tells her that she would conceive and bear a child and that the child would be great, that he would be called the Son of God. He is the one that God had promised for his people, promised to his people. And he will save God's people from their sins and from their enemies. Yes, he does. And at this pronouncement from the angel that she would conceive and bear a son, she's confused. And she says to the angel, how will I possibly get pregnant when I am still a virgin? Mm -hmm. how, how will I possibly get pregnant when I'm not yet married to my betrothed, Joseph? Then the angel tells her that even though she is not yet married, the Lord God will miraculously cause her to become pregnant. She would be the first woman in all of history to become pregnant as a virgin and the last as well. And the child she would give birth to, he would be the son of God and savior of his people. Amen. God miraculously caused a barren woman to conceive, but even more miraculously caused a virgin to conceive. Any Israelite, any ancient Israelite who read this text would have instantly recognized who this prophecy was about. Yes. They would have realized that it was about the Messiah. Messiah means anointed one, one promised from the Lord that he would come to save his people. Mm -hmm. The one chosen by God to deliver his people from their enemies. And Israelites reading this would have scratched their heads and they would have asked, wait a second. How can the Messiah come from a woman in Nazareth? Nazareth is nothing. <laughs> it's a small town north of, of Jerusalem. It's not the place where he's supposed to come from. They all knew that the Messiah was to come from Bethlehem, the birthplace and lineage of King David. <clears throat> Bethlehem to the south of Jerusalem, not to the north. Mm -hmm. So the Israelites must have been confused, wondering how is it possible for this woman from Nazareth to give birth to the Messiah? Then Luke makes the transition in the narrative. He, he, he tells how Mary and this barren woman meet. And then Luke tells about the birth of the barren woman's child. When a child is born to an old and barren woman, all of the neighbors gather around and they're astonished. And they say, this is a miracle. This child will certainly grow to be something great. And Zachariah the father is ecstatic too. And he sings a song of praise to the Lord for the miracle that the Lord has done in his wife and in the world through his son would be a prophet. Blessed is the Lord. It is right after the birth of this first child that we get the, the narrative of the birth of Jesus that we'll be reading more of in a second. We come to this text with a bunch of questions in our heads. Who is this child going to be? 
What is he going to be like? What will his life come to? What will Joseph, her fiancé, think of all this? And how will it be possible for a woman from Nazareth to give birth to the Messiah when everyone knows that the Messiah, that the Messiah comes from Bethlehem? This is where we read the first couple of verses in our text. Let me read them to you again. In those days, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. God reached down into history and shuffled things up. God had changed all of history, shuffled around the people of the entire Roman Empire so that his promises would and could be fulfilled. When it was time for his promised Messiah to come, he caused the Caesar of Rome to decree that everyone must travel to their birth towns to be registered in the census. How does this, this, uh, this world, this empire shifting um, decree affect Mary? How does it affect Mary and Joseph? Well, Mary is engaged to Joseph, so let's see what happens to them in verses 4 and 5. Luke 2, verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Mm -hmm. He went up to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Mary, being engaged to Joseph, has this, this, uh, legally binding, uh, this legally binding bond to Joseph. And when he goes to register, she goes with him. Joseph comes from the royal line of David. Hundreds of years ago, there was a great king of Israel named King David. King David loved the Lord God with all of his heart and was faithful to the Lord. And he delighted in the Lord so that he, he danced for the Lord, and he wrote psalms and hymns to the Lord. Amen. God also loved David, and so he made David a promise. He said, because you have loved me with your whole heart, I will make for you an everlasting kingdom. Mm -hmm. From your descendants, I will make an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom without end. Mm -hmm. God said that there would one day come a descendant from David who would take up David's throne, and that descendant would reign on that throne forever and ever and ever a reign of perfect peace and tranquility. Hallelujah. With no one dethroning him, no one affecting his people or, or, or harming his people. Mm -hmm. This descendant would deliver Israel not just from their enemies, but from their sins, and he would rule over them in an everlasting kingdom. Thank you, Jesus. Ever since the days of David's people, <clears throat> ever since those days when the prophecy was made, that David's descendants and the people of Israel have been waiting. Waiting, waiting for the descendant of David. Joseph was a descendant of King David. So when it was time for Joseph to be registered, he went back to the home of his ancestor, King David. He went back to Bethlehem. And he went up, well, when he went up, he took his fiance with him. So we see that the very pregnant, very pregnant mother of the Messiah travels to the place where the promised king will be born. She travels to him. But not only that, the man who raised, who raised his child as a father, he was a descendant of David. Jesus was, in a sense, from the royal, royal line, and he was about to be born in the royal birthplace. Yes. All things are possible with God. Mary and Joseph travel to Bethlehem, and they eventually arrive in Bethlehem. Let's see what happens when they get there. Verses 6 and 7. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Mary and Joseph arrive at Bethlehem and they go to the common place for travelers to stay in Bethlehem. They go to the inn, they go to the guest house. Maybe it was a, a large house typical of cities in this region at that time that people could go to, a large roofed area they could go to, and, and many families could pack into one house and sleep in a sheltered area while they visited. Mm -hmm. So Mary and Joseph walk up to the entrance of this house, and they, they peer in, and they look to the left, and they look to the right, and it's jam-packed with people. There's, there's blankets on the floor, there's cots, there's people packed in, and there's no room for them at all. 
And so Mary and Joseph go searching for a sheltered place that they can stay, and they find the most significant place you can imagine. They find a stable for animals. It's likely in a cave, but whether or not it's in a cave, uh, we know that it must have been dirty. It must have been smelly. It must have been <coughs> filled with hay, filled with loud sounds and noises. <laughs> While they were huddled in the stable, Mary gives birth to her firstborn son. And once he's born, she does what all the women back then did with their children. She takes him a uh, cloth and wraps it tight around him so that his arms don't flail about. And she lies him in the most comfortable place that she can find, a feeding trough for animals, like the hay in it. This humble way is how the Messiah the Savior of all mankind came into this world. Amen. A woman from an insignificant town goes to the most insignificant place imaginable, a stable with animals and smells and noises and hay, and she gives birth to the, to the single most significant person to ever walk the face of the earth. Amen. A humble woman in a humble place gives birth to the most significant person to ever walk the, place, the face of the earth. This child would go up to be everything that Mary hoped for and much, much more. This child would heal the sick. He would give sight to the blind. He would even raise the dead to life. This child would go on to do even more, though. He would die for the sins of the world. Mary, did you know? He would take all of our guilt, all of our shame with him up onto the cross, paying the ultimate price, dying so that we could, could have our guilt removed from us. And then once he was dead, he raised him to new life so that we could have new life in Hallelujah. Him. This humble child in the feeding trough would go grow up to be the Savior of the world. Amen. God orchestrated history and shuffled people all around the known world so that he could fulfill his promise of sending a Savior to the world. This Savior is Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Mary. Born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, born to die for our sins on the cross. Trust in the Son of God. Yes. Trust in the Son of God. Thank you, Jesus. We have been going through the first two chapters of Luke over the past month, and we've seen in these first two chapters that we must trust in the Son of God. We've seen that we must do so because God himself has sent the Son, his Son, and God himself attests to the fact that he is indeed the Son of God. God attests the Sonship of Jesus by first promising that he would send him. All throughout the Old Testament, God sent prophets to speak to the people of Israel. These prophets foretold that God would send his Son into the world. God foretold that this son would be of the lineage and family of David, and he would be born in Bethlehem. And this is exactly what happens in Luke chapter 2. In verses 4 and 5, we see the repeated phrase that Joseph was from Bethlehem, from the lineage of David. Because of this, Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem, and the child was born there. Yes. We also see that Mary conceives this child, and that the child is born. While she is still a virgin. If we look back to chapter 1, we see uh, this declaration a little more clearly. Let's read uh, Luke chapter 1, 35 and 36 together. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Mary asked the angel a question, how will all of these things take place since I'm a virgin? And the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the child will be called Holy, the Son of God. The child was born, though Mary was a virgin. This truth is again confirmed in chapter 2 when we read that Mary was merely betrothed to Joseph and not married to him. Verse 5 of chapter 2, to be registered with Mary, his Betrothed who was with child. Not a married woman, but a betrothed woman who was with child. Finally, we see a confirmation of Jesus' identity in the following text. 
Let's look at verse uh, Luke 2, verse 8 and 14 together. Luke 2, let's read the next, uh, the next first portion of the next text. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Amen. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Not just one angel, but a host of angels comes declaring that this is the Son of God. He is the Savior uh, from the city of David. He is Christ the Lord. And because he has come, the whole host brings glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom God is pleased. This child was indeed the Son of God. This child came as a Savior, as the promised descendant of David, and he came to save us from our sins. Thank you, Jesus. The popular hymn goes like this. Away in the manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down the sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. Jesus, a tiny child, lying in a manger full of hay. He came to us in the humblest ways, but he came as the fulfillment of prophecy promised by the Lord. And while he was here on this earth, he accomplished the greatest of works imagined. Amen. Jesus made it possible for us to be right with God. Yes. But to be right with God, we must trust in him, the only Son of God. Yes. The question for you is, do you trust Jesus? Yes. Are you trusting in him daily? Are you trusting in him with your life, with your mind, with your actions, with your emotions and your affections? If you have never yet in this life trusted Jesus and made that decision to trust in him with your life and with everything that you have, today's the day. Trust in Jesus. Yes, trust in Jesus. You can indeed trust in Jesus. He has died for your sins. He has paid the price for your guilt and your shame. And if you trust in him and live for him and repent of all the wrongdoing that you have done, that you can be saved. If you have trusted in him previously, if you're currently a believer and you're following Jesus, if, if you have believed in him once in the past, do you still trust him? Do you still trust him in the daily things? Holidays can be hard. Many struggle during the holidays and missing their loved ones and feeling lonely. Who do you turn to during difficult holiday seasons? Jesus. Who do you turn to? You turn to Jesus. Jesus Christ died and paid the price for our sins so that we can have peace. Peace on earth with those whom God is pleased. We were guilty and dead in our sins and our trespasses, but we can have peace with God. Amen. Amen. Though we still have struggles in this world, though we struggle with depression and, and loneliness and and, and with the loss of our loved ones, we can turn to the Lord knowing that He loves us and we will be with Him when He returns. Yes. Amen. Trust in the Son of God. The Son of God came to us quiet, still, and lying in the manger. Mm -hmm. This humble Son of God has saved us from our sins. Hallelujah. Trust in the Son of God. Yes. Let's pray together this morning. Oh Lord God, we trust in you. We declare and shout and proclaim our trust in you, knowing that you have saved us from our sins. Thank you, Jesus. If we trust in you, if we believe in you, if we believe in the Son of God and trust in you.
Lord God, we pray that you would take this trust with us tomorrow morning, Monday morning when we wake up. We pray that we would take this trust when we travel to our families for Christmas. We pray that we would take this trust when we struggle at home alone, not able to gather with our families for Christmas. We pray and we trust in you even when life is tough and holidays are difficult. Lord, please be with us. Please bring us your peace during this holiday season. Please bring us joy and help us to remember on the 25th why we celebrate and what Christmas is all about. It's about the, the Son of God incarnate here on this earth, dwelling with us, assuming human flesh so that we can have peace with God. Yes. Lord, we love you, yes. and we trust you, and we honor you. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name that we pray. We're going to sing another hymn this morning.